Day. A Cold War relic or a vital tool in the fight against terror? Why peace campaigners are stepping up their opposition to this controversial Yorkshire spy base? Plus the families who say they face losing their homes because of a reduction in benefits. And the political apprentice from Lincolnshire who fears that many young people are facing a bleak future. I know some young people who have failed in over 150 job applications. I know young, some young people who feel like they can't be the next entrepreneurs, the next Alan Sugars, the next Richard Bransons. In exactly a year's time, the Americans will go to the polls to decide whether Barack Obama should remain US president or whether there should be a new face in the White House. Whoever the next leader of the free world happens to be, they'll face the wrath of peace campaigners from Yorkshire who are trying to stop the expansion of the controversial Men With Hill spy base near Harrogate. Here's Len Tingle. <laughs> Guided walks in rural North Yorkshire are fairly common, but not like this one. This is the CND guided walk to Men With Hill. They've even printed their own leaflet for walkers, giving details of what's one of the most secret defence establishments in Europe. I think it's, um, it's important that people get to see things in the context of, of where they live or where others live and the communities in which they upset or disturb. Men with Hill on the edge of the North York Moors near Harrogate is nominally an RAF base. But around 2,200 Americans work here, either US military or the National Security Agency. For decades now, these golf balls have been built here. Each one part of a system for electronically eavesdropping on potential terrorists or tracking hostile missile launchers. Up until the 1950s, there were just farmers living around here. But since then, the expansion has been constant. It hasn't stopped despite the end of the Cold War. In fact, these last two domes were only finished earlier this year. It brings the total to 33. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. And my status is launched. This is what that latest expansion at Menwith Hill is about. This was the first test firing of the United States interceptor missiles back in 2007. A screen of them are being built on former Iron Curtain military sites like this one in Poland. A new weapon to hunt and destroy hostile missiles which could come from a new enemy, the so-called rogue states of South Korea or Iran. Far away men with Hill, American technicians will be commanding and controlling those new interceptor missiles. You asked people to move away, didn't you? No, I didn't. Yes, you did, and you calmed people down. It was very good. There were no problems. No, no pushing. On Tuesday night, as she does every Tuesday night, veteran peace campaigner Lindis Percy held a small demonstration at the base gates. She had high hopes that incoming President Obama would stop the expansion here. That simply didn't happen. This is an American base occupied and controlled by the Americans. Unaccountable, secretive and out of the control of the British government, we would argue. Imagine if the tables were turned and it was the reverse, and the United Kingdom had bases in the United States of America. Can you imagine the US authorities allowing us to carry on there without telling them exactly what was going on and making sure senators and Congress people are actually aware? Uh, of course they would want to know. As for the British government, it says Menwith Hill is an RAF base which cooperates with the United States and it's a vital part of a defensive screen for the whole of the Western world. Our guests today are Hugh Bailey, the Labour MP for York Central, and Stuart Andrew, Conservative MP for Pudsey. Um, Hugh Bailey, some would argue that if men with Hill really are keeping an eye on the bad guys, they should be applauded and not subjected to constant protest. Is that a fair point? I think it is a fair point. If you want to keep the peace in Britain, you want to deter attacks on Britain. And missile defence isn't about attacking anyone, it's about protecting us in Britain if someone were to fire a missile at us. And you can't do it as one country on your own. Uh, these days you have to uh, 
work in tandem with other countries, uh, the countries which are also, like Britain, members of NATO, with the forward bases where the interceptor missile would be shot from, but the uh, listening mechanisms need to be further away from where the attack's likely to happen, so you've got more time to analyze what's going on, make sure you don't make a mistake, and that's why Britain's the place where uh, some of these interceptors, not all of them, well, some, of, some of these listeners... Fabian Hamilton, your fellow Labour MP, clearly doesn't agree with you. I mean, he makes a fair point. If the RAF pitched up in Alabama and said they wanted to uh, have a spy base there, the Americans wouldn't allow that, would they? Well, of course, you do have British uh, service personnel seconded to work uh, within US military um, establishments. It's one of the things that comes from us being part of a military alliance, NATO. Uh, and there is parliamentary supervision and oversight of these things through the Defence Select Committee, through the Intelligence Committee in our parliament, through similar committees in the American parliament, uh, and through bodies like the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, which brings MPs from all the NATO countries together to look at these matters uh, on a joint basis. Stuart Andrew, Menwith Hill's not a million miles away from your pudsy constituency. Uh, do we have the right to know what exactly goes on there? Well, I think Hugh is right. You know, we are, with the Cold War may be over, but there are other rogue nations out there and we need to be secure. Uh, and I think it is right that it is there. And Parliament does have a, a vast array of mechanisms to ensure that we know, you know, that there is liaison going on with, with the people that are working at Menwith Hill, of which a lot of them are from, from this country. So I think uh, Hugh is absolutely right. It's vital that we have that facility there protecting us for our future. But Hugh Bailey, are you totally happy with the fact that missiles which could be fired from the Czech Republic and Poland are now being controlled from North Yorkshire. Doesn't that make your home county a target? Well, unfortunately, it's because we are potentially a target that we have to have defences against people who have uh, malign intentions. And we know from the Cold War period, we're past Cold War now, but we know from the Cold War period, uh, that having weapons to retaliate against an attack actually deterred people from attacking. I, I think, sadly, well-intentioned though they are, CND were wrong then in the Cold War, and they're still wrong now. Interesting debate. Let's just change tack slightly because I want to reflect on a more imminent decision which will have an effect on a lot of people in our part of the world and that's the decision as to whether to close the Leeds-based children's heart surgery unit which serves uh, most of Yorkshire. Now, uh, this brave little lad here was saved there. His mum and dad were grateful that they didn't have to travel to Newcastle or Liverpool or Leicester for surgery. But that's what would have happened if these proposals go ahead and uh, we switch to fewer regional-based uh, centres. Stuart Andrew, you've been one of the leading campaigners against the closure. Now, many MPs are telling us now you've virtually now lost the battle. It's inevitable the Leeds Children's Heart Surgery Unit will close. Is that the information you're getting? No, not really. I mean, I don't, I don't, no, no, none of us know, that's the point. I mean, there is the judicial review that's going to be held by the Royal Brompton. That's going to delay it until December. The final decision has not yet been made. And we've put up a very strong case as to why there should be a unit here in Leeds, based on centres of population, based on the fact that we have co-location of services. And 600,000 people signing a petition is a very strong message. So it's not over yet. And even even if it goes against us, there are still avenues that I think that we need to consider but taking. But are you really optimistic? Well, I'm always an optimistic person, and I think the campaign has been phenomenal, and anybody that hasn't listened to it has got one hell of a fight on their hands, frankly. So are the campaigners now going to change tack? Are they, what, are you, what are you going to do to try and force an 11th hour reprieve? Well, I, I, the more we go on, the more I'm concerned, actually, that this isn't just about us losing Leeds. If Leeds closes, I can't see how Newcastle can reach the 400 operations a year figure that it suggests, because people in South York Yorkshire, I think, would gravitate towards Birmingham. People in West Yorkshire would gravitate towards the centre in Liverpool. So that would mean that Newcastle would struggle to reach those figures and I believe that that would then be under threat, leaving the whole of the north of England with just one unit. Well, That's not acceptable. We'll keep an eye on that decision, possibly due later this month. Now, the politics show can reveal that many of our town halls have seen a big increase in the number of inquiries they receive from people who are worried about losing their homes. Some Yorkshire parents claim that a cap on housing benefit will force them to leave the areas where they work and where they've brought their children up. Nick Morris has the story. St George's Crypt has been providing shelter for the city's homeless for almost a century. During the bitter cold of last year's record-breaking winter, the charity struggled but managed to find a bed for everyone. 
it's scary and freezing. It doesn't matter what you have on or what if you've got any quilts or anything, it's still cold. And the problem's expected to get much bigger. Not only that, it's affecting a much wider variety of people. We are beginning to see a greater proliferation of people coming, people from a professional background. We are very concerned that there's a high level of young people who attend at the crypt are between 16 and 25. A year ago, these women would never have dreamt that they'd be in danger of losing their homes. But government cutbacks have put a cap on housing benefits, and many of them are saying they'll not be able to afford their rents, even in Acom, a very modest suburb of York. Low-paid families used to be able to claim enough housing benefit to make sure they had few worries about their rent. The cap means that's no longer the case. Most of the people who I've spoken to are saying they have a shortfall of about 150 to 200 pounds a month. When they've approached the council to explain the predicament and hoping that maybe there's some help with their, their housing discretionary fund, they are actually being told to move to a cheaper area. In fact, that can present problems in itself. I mean, a lot of these low-income workers, they are working in theatres, they are nursery workers, they operate the checkouts in the local supermarkets. If that happens, we're going to start losing a workforce that is actually keeping the city running. These women are so worried, they've formed a local group called Tree of Mums. They want to know why low-paid families are the ones being left to sort out the government's budget deficit. George Osborne announced in this year's budget that housing benefits has to change. The Chancellor said new measures are needed because the cost of housing benefits has risen 50% to £21 billion a year over the last 10 years. Mr Osborne said that as a country we now spend more on housing benefits than we do on the police and our universities combined. City of York Council Housing Options Team. This is the emergency homelessness hotline at City of York Council. Calls here have gone up by a third in just a year, and it's happening elsewhere. When we have 50% of York's population on a household income of around £23,000, it's potentially eating up 39% of income. Now, um, the national sort of guidance that a lot of organisations use is that you shouldn't spend more than 25% of your income on housing, so obviously people are starting to have problems. Figures obtained by the politics show reveal that Leeds Council has seen the amount of calls to its housing hotline rise by 42% compared to last year. Bradford Council has seen a 46% rise. Sheffield Council is predicting a 15% increase, but that's on top of a 44% rise last year. Private rents in Yorkshire are expected to rise by 20% over the next five years. The government's promising a tougher benefit system following root and branch reform. For Yorkshire's next generation, there may literally be no place like home. Nick, thank you. Some interesting stats there. Hugh Bailey with the housing benefit bill costing more than the police and university budgets combined. Can you understand why the government had to take drastic action? The trouble with the government's plan is that they could actually push up the bill. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, high cost, high rent areas like York are being grouped together with low rent areas uh, elsewhere in North Yorkshire and East Yorkshire. So that the rent paid to people in places like York is less than they actually pay, as you hear, maybe a shortfall of £200 a month. And some people are therefore being forced to uh, places 20, 30 miles away, and when they move that far, they lose their jobs. All right. Stuart Andrew, is this the politics of Norman Tebbit again? If you don't like where you live, if you can't afford to live where you live, it's on your bike. Well, no, I don't think it is. I mean, there's two things. One, you're right to say that the, the housing benefit, the cost of it, has doubled over the last ten years. We're spending something like £20 billion, and it looks like it will go up by another quarter uh, within the next couple of years. So we've got to deal with that. Also, I think a lot of private landlords are seeing the housing benefit as a benchmark for what they can charge. So we've got to try and use this to try and get a real, you know, a bit of sense of reality in the housing market. But this is only part of a much wider problem. Frankly, not enough has been done to build affordable and social housing over the last 20 years and that's why we've got to look at this in conjunction with the raft of measures to help people to live where they want to. But I mean you heard there in that report that we're talking about nursery workers, supermarket 
checkout staff, you know, low paid workers being forced out of areas. Some would say it's, you know, it's, the, it's the poorest people, again, bearing an unfair burden of deficit cuts. And equally, I get a lot of people saying to me who go out to work and don't get housing benefit, they're on low income, and they see other people who are not working on housing benefit living in much better properties than them. So it's about trying to balance that out, and it's not going to be easy. We've got to keep a, you know, an eye on it to make sure that there aren't bad and un unintended consequences. Well, but there's a serious crisis in our housing. Hugh Bailey, where would Labour have found the money to pay for housing benefit if you were still in power? Our social security policies incentivised people to get off benefits and into work. And if you get people into work, their housing benefit cost comes down because they're paying part of their rent themselves. And their other benefits, of course, uh, they're, they're not on benefits then because they're earning. If you force people to move 20 or 30 miles uh, to somewhere where there's no jobs, then you uh, increase the number of people who are unemployed. And we can see at the moment that unemployment is rising. Therefore, you increase the benefits bill. So the short term attempt to squeeze housing benefit actually is going to end up co costing the government more. And that's a move in the wrong direction. Well, stay with us because homelessness and unemployment were two of the big talking points as the MPs of the future held their annual debate in the House of Commons on Friday. Members of the UK Youth Parliament filled the famous green benches and we caught up with a teenage entrepreneur from Lincolnshire who believes young people have been let down by the older generation of politicians. The first debate today will be should university education across the United Kingdom be made free as it is? Of £3.5 billion to give every young person the right to free education. My name's Joseph Hyatt, I'm 18 and I'm a serving member of Youth Parliament for the constituency of Sleaford and North Highcombe in Lincolnshire. I'm off to the House of Commons to debate on the issues that affect young people in this country. The most pressing issue on the bill is child poverty in the UK and the issue of youth unemployment. I believe we need to work together to give young people hope and the opportunities they deserve. My message in the Commons is going to be very, very simple. Look at the efforts and opportunities that are out there for young people that need to be developed. There's a lot of projects, pockets of efforts going on that the government needs to recognise and we need to unite together to work together as a society to make young people feel welcome, to feel like they have opportunities and to make sure our country has a stronger, more enterprising and economically competitive economy because our young people are the future of that economy. Simple as. I want to highlight the skills and talents that young people have but also more importantly I want to make everyone realise that young people have been stigmatised, they have been isolated. We need to bin that stigma and we need to redefine just how amazing young people are and just to really make it clear that they are the future of our country and we have to believe in them. I know some young people who have failed in over 150 job applications. I know young, some young people who feel like they can't be the next entrepreneurs, the next Alan Sugars, the next Richard Bransons. You can be whatever you want to be and that will be my message to young people but to the decision makers it will be we need to support young people to help them have a future. Order, order, good morning and welcome. You have only to look at how few young people vote in elections to realise that there is a problem. Do I understand why young people feel sometimes that decisions made by much older people at the top and even discussions that precede those decisions don't fully take account of what they're saying or thinking or experiencing? The answer is I do understand that. My message to any key decision makers, the current government or a future government is very, very simple. We need to recognise young people's achievements, celebrate their skills and talents, give them the opportunities they deserve, but work together to create those opportunities for a more competitive, economically stronger and enterprising Britain of the future. I'm sure he's going to go far, but I mean, Stuart Andrew, uh, Joseph there says young people have been stigmatised by politicians. Is that fair? Well, I don't think entirely, but I do get his points. I mean, I think, you know, a, a lot of older generation do sometimes brush aside uh, the younger generation. And I see, and I think we all see as MPs, the tremendous contribution that young people make to our society. They lobby us very, very effectively in Parliament. And the fact that they've stood up in that chamber is a credit to them. You know, people like Joseph are a credit to our, our region, really. Yeah, uh, Hugh Bailey, I mean, do you, can you understand, I mean, this, Mr. Speaker seems to understand why young people feel let down down by politicians of a certain generation? Well, some and some would be the answer. I mean, this is a young man who would make anybody feel 
uh, proud and what a <laughs> contrast with the people we saw in the riots and that of course gave young people a, a, a bad image but it was sort of one in a hundred who one in a thousand who was uh, creating trouble so the message to politicians is listen to what young people have to say they want skills they want to build businesses they want to have apprenticeships they want to have a future for themselves and they're right to demand that politicians listen and react and give them that sort of future well thank you both for your time today and we've just time to mention that uh, if you're a budding politician and you want to get involved with this year's